Good afternoon and welcome to Chatham House uh, and to the launch of a new Chatham House report called Myths and Misconceptions in the Debate on Russia. My name is Renata Duan and I'm Deputy Director of Chatham House uh, and we're so welcome and uh, delighted to welcome you here today to this panel discussion uh, on the report. The report, which is available on our website, is uh, produced by our Russia and Eurasia program and is really a compilation of expert perspectives from uh, our, across our Chatham House uh, program, staff and associate fellows working on and in Russia and the Eurasian region. So we're delighted to have, um, I think, 14 of the 17 with us here today for a really what I hope will be a rich and interactive uh, discussion. Today's discussion is on the record and will be recorded and you'll be able to access this discussion later from our website. Uh, we'll ask you to engage. We'd love to get your questions and perspectives uh, and to have a chance for you to interact with the authors. We'll ask you to do that by entering your question in the Q&A function at any time during the course of the session and we'll upload those votes and I'll communicate your questions. So please do feel free to engage in this way. Now, the question of Russia and the question of Russia as to use Churchill's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma is, is of course not new to, to the West and to Western debates about Russia. This new report argues that Russia's domestic and foreign policies are, are poorly understood in the West. Uh, these myths, as, as the report argues, that the West is prone to, and by the West, I think it means, and we we'll, can talk about that, but Europe and North America, is at best leading to poorly understood responses and ineffective uh, strategies for engagement uh, with Russia, and at worst, uh, driven by wishful thinking that can often produce um, negative outcomes. So if the implications of these myths are weak and fragmented policy responses, what can uh, we do about them? The report sets out a series of policy recommendations in key domestic foreign policy near and uh, far abroad uh, areas uh, of concern. So today, what we're really keen to do is begin that discussion, look at some of the key myths. Uh, we can't explore all 17 of them in detail, but very much uh, driven by your questions and areas, unpack a little bit some of the thinking as to why these myths uh, exist, uh, to what extent uh, they're so pervasive and why, and the extent to which they might be overcome in policy processes of European and uh, North American policymakers. To start our discussion, we have four of the authors today who are going to join us for a short panel discussion. Uh, and then when we open up to the Q&A, uh, many more of the authors will be online and willing and able to answer your questions at any one time. So let me just briefly introduce our four panelists today. We have first James Nixie, uh, who heads the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House. Uh, Ekaterina Schulman, who is an associate fellow with the program. Uh, third, we have Kier Giles, also associate fellow with the program from Chatham House. And then fourth, but, uh, we have Annette Bohr, who is joining us uh, to speak about misconceptions about Russia and China. So to make the most of our time, I'm going to kick straight off uh, and uh, I'll start, if I may, James, with you uh, uh, as to these questions. Maybe just share with us, first of all, what's new about these myths uh, that you're writing about in this report? Uh, I quoted Churchill from 1939, but where are we in this space today? Are there new myths or have the myths gone stronger? Uh, thanks very much, Renata, and welcome everybody. It's a great privilege to, to see you all here. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, <clears throat> to answer the question, I suppose, uh, uh, speaking more holistically, I, mean, I, I suppose one of the very privileges of working in an independent think tank is the freedom we enjoy to investigate and highlight issues or travesties even we deem of the greatest importance, a uh, privilege I, I really honestly never forget. I don't think it's so much, in, in a way, it's almost the opposite, Renata, but I think... Uh, these myths are not so much 
some of these myths are new and some of them are old. I'll, I'll explain. We've all encountered over the years, ad nauseum really, not just in Chatham House round tables, but, but out of the mouths of serving politicians and other influential figures, um, and then making their way into policy, which has obviously been unsatisfactory, not, not unsatisfactory because we failed to turn Russia into a, a cozy, touchy-feely liberal democracy. That's way beyond our reach, of course, but because we failed to protect the integrity of our own systems and, and in some cases, the lives of our own people. So uh, the, that's a reason, if you like, that, that some of these myths that, that, that um, we failed is because some of these myths have become embedded over, over space and time. So it's so a way of example, if you like, um, the myth that Russia was promised that NATO would not enlarge, tackled by John Luff, um, is a rather hoary old trope that crops up frequently. And it's probably particularly vexing to John, who set up a first NATO liaison office in Russia way back in the last century. Well, the myth that, that all decision making is done by Putin without regard to any other individual is, is not just a sort of a personal bugbear for Ekaterina Schulman and Ben Noble in their chapter, but it's something genuinely unhelpful and possibly even dangerous when having interactions with Russia at an official level or otherwise. My chapter, for example, on, also on Russia and China, um, is the contention that we should make nice with Russia, uh, presumably uh, forgiving and forgetting the, the recent past and turning a blind, blind eye to future transgression in order to, to gang up, I suppose, more effectively on China. That's especially, that's, that is newer and that's especially modish right now. But these myths about Russia are pervasive, corrosive and, and inevitable, but we shouldn't just accept them. Uh, in fact, they should be debunked as far as is possible. Um, for the purpose of giving policymakers as accurate a picture as possible in order to make the best decisions for Western core interests. Thanks, James. Isn't one of the reasons why myths abound in countries because of the difficulty of accessing uh, the country's policy or thinking or engagement? So I guess, is Russian policy, Russian action so inscrutable? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in a country that was long and tumultuous and controversial history as Russia, um, that is inevitable. It's in, the, it's in its nature, it's in the nature of myths, it's in the nature of Russia. I, I couldn't say if there are more myths emanating from Russia than from anywhere else, but um, the thing is they, they do provide a superficially attractive explanation, of course. It's a, it's, it's a common error to infer, as we all know, that things that are consecutive in order of time necessarily have a relationship of cause and effect. So while some of these myths you know, are a result of an understandable lack of knowledge, um, many, if not most, are cultivated and propagated by the Kremlin. They don't just serve Russia's interests as a, as a self-proclaimed great power or great power aspirant. They're, they're essential to the regime's survival and to its credibility with its own people and, and with itself. Take another example. I mean, take, 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 the, take the example of James Scher's chapter, um, which is effectively whataboutism, as we call it, um, the first chapter of the, of the publication. It's, it's superficially attractive when you look at the travesties committed by the West, but it breaks down when you look at the scale and the context of those Travis is committed by Russia. Thanks, James. And I'm sure we'll come back to that in the Q&A for sure. But I'd like to bring in Ekaterina now, if I may, because Ekaterina, we're looking at the fourth term in office of Putin and nearly two decades on, there is often a tendency to, to conflate the Russian state with the Putin state, let's say. But to what extent is Putin the state and, and can you help us unpack that a little bit thank you for the question and thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, be here as part of this discussion and as part of this collection of uh, articles uh, i think i'm the if i'm not mistaken i'm the only one among the authors who is actually based in moscow which doesn't make me the most knowing uh <laughs> of all the participants, but still gives a kind of peculiarity to uh, my position. Also, I think that uh, our chapter, uh, Ben's and mine, uh, together with possibly uh, the uh, succeeding chapter by Nikolai Petrov, are the two ones dedicated to uh, internal uh, Russian affairs, to internal policy, rather than to uh, foreign policy. When I was invited to uh, join this effort, uh, I was enthusiastic, and I must say, that despite the many months of work, my enthusiasm hasn't cooled, well, maybe a little bit, uh, but not quite evaporated, uh, because in my sphere of uh, competence, and I study and teach legislative process, and therefore Russian internal decision-making process, myths and misunderstandings absolutely abound. Uh, I was kind of irritated even by this quotation from Churchill about Russia being so enigmatic, because it's sort of 
reminds me of the century old myth about the mysteriousness of women. You may remember this trope. Women are so unscrutable. One never knows what they want. There's a mystery around them. And there's even something enchanting about this mystery. And this mystification, this othering, goes hand in hand with another bad thing, simplification, for some reason. If we name something, hard to understand, mysterious, unpredictable, then we tend at the same time to offer simplistic explanations of the behavior of this same subject. subject. And it's, it's the same, uh, well, misfortune uh, with uh, discussing Russia. Myths would not be, and misconceptions wouldn't be so durable if they hadn't had some foundation in fact they can never be completely groundless. And that's the problem. When we say, as we say with Ben in our chapter, Russian policy making, policy implementation is not all about Putin. The personification of political process is overblown. Uh, Russia is governed by a widespread partly competent uh, and very resourceful bureaucracy. Then people say, oh yes, but all the important things are decided by the president personally, or isn't he the maker and the creator of this system? And then you have trouble explaining things because yes, of course, the president is powerful. He's been on his job for 20 years. He's as much a creation of this bureaucratic system as the creator of it. They are interdependent uh, political uh, organisms. So every expert explanation finally boils down to saying it's complicated. It's not so simple as you think. It's not how it looks. Uh, and speaking about the other issue, uh, you mentioned transparency or lack of transparency, which uh, relates to this same uh, famous Russian mysteriousness. One of the points that we make in our chapter is that while, of course, uh, Russia not being an electoral democracy or a liberal democracy is not very uh, fond of publicity or transparency, and the prevalence of propaganda, of course, models public sphere, uh, public environment, informational sphere with intentional or uh, not, not intentional uh, disinformation. But at the same time, being so bureaucratic, and bureaucracy tends to regulate everything that moves, and regulation happens by papers, there's quite a lot of publicly available open data, open information, which is out there for those who know how to find it and how to read it. So we have quite enough uh, sources, again, open sources, which allow us to judge of the state machine's intentions, uh, decisions, uh, success or lack of success uh, in implementing those decisions. But this, reading these sources, understanding this information demands a special set of skills. And this again leaves us open to the accusation which is often aimed at experts, that every expert recommendation is about we need more experts and we need more budgets for expertise. This doesn't sound very virtuous, but still, uh, this is a necessary thing. Uh, instead of musing about the mysteriousness uh, of Russia, we'd better really uh, invest into expertise which can both communicate with and understand the pronouncements, uh, the public position, uh, the internal workings of this same great and mighty, sometimes clumsy, sometimes effective bureaucratic system. And this is what we tried to explain as best we could uh, in the chapter that we co-authored with uh, Ben Noble. Thanks, Ekaterina. So the point that myths, in a way, contribute to the prolongation of this notion of unscrutability and unpacking it is not only necessary, but feasible if if you know where to look and how to ask the right questions. I do want to come back to you a little bit later on questions arising, arising from the relationship between Putin and the bureaucracy, and in particular, the relationship between something that is, gets a lot of coverage in the West, which is the uh, elites around Putin, and in particular, the wealthy sort of um, Moscow-based elite. Uh, I'm just thinking of a report this week that was in the Financial Times about oligarchs and, and billionaires and Russia's high rate uh, of billionaires. Um, so I, I'm going to pause you on that, but I'd like to come back to that in the questions 
if we can, to talk about some of the drivers of, of domestic uh, policy therein. But before that, I'd like to move on to Kier, just uh, one of the um, authors of, of this work. And Kier, you, you have focused in particular on, on a number of questions, but also on, on Russian foreign policy and, and Russia's engagement uh, abroad. And, and one of the things that I, I think we've seen in the last 15 years has been a certain amount of expansion of Russian um, policy engagement beyond a focus on the near abroad, beyond the focus on its immediate uh, region. But we've seen Syria, we've seen uh, quite a bit of action uh, in Africa, Libya, we've seen through the Wagner Group, uh, Russia's engagement and interaction. So, I mean, I'm putting it to you, do we have a sense of, of Russia as a more internationalized actor, or at least is there a more risk, higher risk appetite in Russia's foreign policy engagements uh, today than we've seen in the past? Well, Renate, I think yes to all of the above. And uh, importantly, this comes back to a point you've already raised. Is Russia inscrutable or is it to some degree actually predictable? I'd agree completely with you, Katerina, that yes, we can parse what we see being said by Russia, but also to suggest that, uh, that we don't know what Russia is going to do next is to suggest that we've learned absolutely nothing not only from the last 30 years of Russian actions and declarations, but also from preceding history. And what we're seeing now is the culmination of a trend of Russia being able to reassert itself, not new policy, not new initiatives, not a new drive for what Russia wants to do coming from Moscow, but instead the capabilities developing to match the intentions. We saw that progress very clearly in the difference between Russia's reactions to Western intervention in Libya in 2011 and in Syria in 2015. In Libya, there were protests despite the, uh, the abstention in the United Nations against Western intervention. By the time of Syria, post Crimea, Russia felt able to actually do something about it. And so while the, the current policy from Moscow has been more or less unchanged throughout the whole of the post-Cold War period, and that's something which is routinely underestimated in the West, the extent to which Russia was still talking itself, about itself as a great power during the 1990s. What's changed now is that they have the resources and the will and the lack of restraint to actually push hard to achieve those ambitions. But that final point that you're talking about is a change really that's come about over the last two to three years, that push for global entrance, interest and influence. And the fact that Russia is now looking to find inroads in places where it had no traditional interest and no immediately obvious gain for its policy or for its economics. Uh, the, the headlines that you were talking about there, the, the Wagner Group in Central Africa, involvement in Syria, Libya, etc., are just the tip of the iceberg. There's a much broader global initiative to try to resurrect that influence that Moscow had previously, including expanding it to areas where they were never previously a factor. And can I ask you, is that driven um, here by a clear strategy? Is it driven by an assessment of interests and focus and objectives, or is it an opportunistic uh, approach, which is where, where, where there's opportunities to engage, to challenge, to particularly to challenge US uh, and, and Western interests? Well, this is one of the, the key questions that comes up again and again when people ask us just what is it that uh, Russia is looking for? And uh, we always have to challenge the phrasing of the question because as with so many things, it's not an either or question. It's presented as either Russia has a grand strategy or it takes opportunities where they present themselves, but the two are not mutually exclusive, like so many other things which we think are, are different, but which for Russia are all part of the same approach. Now, I've heard it described uh, not so much as a strategy that Russia has, but of a vision of something that it wants to achieve in the long term, along the road to which it will take these opportunities that when they present themselves, when there is the sense of a vacuum of, of will or of presence or of intention by Western countries, and Russia can expand its encroachments and its influence and its weight and its relative importance in the world. So it is both. Yes, there is a strategy in the form of an ideal that Russia wants to aspire to. But at the same time, we need to be alert for targets of opportunity that Russia may see of interest. Thanks. Thanks, Kier. Maybe I can bring in you here, Annette, uh, in terms of objectives and goals. Um, this is a you've written in, in contributed to the report on the question of Russia-China relations. And you've challenged the myth that, uh, that we should uh, drive uh, a wedge, the West should seek to drive a wedge between Russia and China. Um, 
I guess the question there that I would frame to you, to what extent is there a, an, an access or, or, or an alliance between these two countries, both in their interests, but their vision, as, as Kier said, and, and their agendas in terms of how they relate themselves into the international system, norms, rules, and institutions? All right, well, thank you, Renata. Well, I would say that adherents of my myth in particular tend to ascribe a behavioral convergence and a sort of grand conspiratorial character to the Sino-Soviet relationship. But in fact, each state's commanding imperative is to retain full autonomy in decision-making. And while it's true that the Sino-Russian Entente is booming and Beijing and Moscow as close as they've ever been, fundamentally, their relationship is based on each state's calculated and concrete interests. And so the degree of competition between China and the West or the degree of conflict between Russia and the West for that matter, whether increasing or decreasing, is not going to change that bottom line. But at the same time, this de facto non-aggression pact that Putin and, and Xi Jinping have established in recent years stands in stark contrast to the fraught period during the Cold War of the Southern Soviet split. So as things become more fraught with the West, this pact gives both Beijing and Moscow one less theater of conflict to worry about. And as regards the increased potential for a Russia-China alliance in general, yes, the two powers have complementary economies and interests in the spheres of technology, cyber cooperation and defense. For its part, Moscow is in a hurry to close deals on the sale of sensitive and, and um, uh, other technologies, sensitive military and other technologies to China before Beijing's own research and development advances make such purchases obsolete. But it's important to bear in mind here that China is the principal driver of economic growth within the relationship, which puts Moscow at risk of economic and political dependency on Beijing. Ultimately, this disbalance will give China huge pricing power over Russia, leading to an even more lopsided relationship. At present though, the two powers have more to gain from cooperation and competition. And so both Russia and China have chosen to push their differences to the background for the foreseeable future. But in the much longer term, perhaps in, in a decade or so, um, the widening gap in the two states' capacities is likely to prove a game changer that could presage a fundamental shift in the relationship. So Russia coming from a position of uh, convenience, both sides, both powers, Russia and China, seeing a certain convenience in the relationship, but the asymmetry in the relationship, uh, and in, in particular, as you said, Annette, the power balance having some, uh, some significance. I was struck uh, last week listening to a debate on the Security Council uh, under the Chinese presidency on the future of multilateralism at how uh, Russia, uh, or let me say China and the US both referenced a lot the rules-based international order, mm -hmm. the rules-based international system and their commitment to it. And I was struck by how Russia challenged that notion in Lavrov in his speech questioned why use the rules-based international system rather than international law and that there's something there's something subversive for international law to use this framing. Um, maybe just to ask you in it, do you think that you know in this respect Russia is contesting the current international system and framework of, of order institutions frameworks in a way that China isn't? Certainly. I mean, for its part, Russia feels that it's been the loser in the current economic order. Um, and so it, 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 it definitely finds utility in partnering with Russia uh, because it dovetails perfectly with its quest to restore a measure of international prominence during its twilight years as a leading global power. Whereas China, on the other hand, for its part, finds utility in Russian efforts to bring down a US-led international order. But it is less concerned with forming a fully fledged alliance with Russia than it is with ensuring that Moscow does not get in the way of its upward global trajectory. And we have to remember here that Russia and China have different views of the international order. Beijing envisions a, a future world order that revolves around the US-China relationship. 
with other major powers playing roles to varying degrees, of course, while Moscow is not ready to view itself as a second tier power and so wants to see a world order that gives it an equal status, at least in, in certain spheres. I would also say that in addition, the relative decline of US power and the rise of China has meant that policymakers in both Moscow and Beijing see a greater chance to modify some international institutions. But as I mentioned before, Renata, many Western observers tend to greatly overestimate the degree of coordination between Chinese and Russian policies, often viewing Russia and China as some sort of strategic, single strategic entity that was somehow allowed uh, to develop by negligent Western policymakers. And this downplaying of tensions within the Sino-Soviet partnership, together with the depiction of the relationship as a grand alliance against the West, allows Beijing and Moscow to use the specter of coordinated action, particularly in the military sphere, I would say, to spook Western policymakers and ultimately plays into Russian and Chinese views of the US as a declining power that is seeking to reassert its, its dominance and with limited advantage. Fascinating, Annette, and we're going to come back to that, I'm sure, in the questions uh, uh, session later. I'd like to just take the last question to the panelists to go back to Ekaterina, because I think it would be great to get to end with a view from Moscow, uh, at least this portion of the discussion. Ekaterina, you know, this question that we've heard of, of foreign policy, uh, perhaps scale of ambition, uh, Kier talked about a rising sense of a vision. Um, Annette talked about a contest uh, of, of a vision of an international uh, order. Back home in Moscow, to what extent, uh, what does the world look like? Does it look like a threatening world in which Russia is, is faced by enemies on all sides? Does the uh, Putin uh, sense of, of uh, Russia as a great power still hold uh, attraction, particularly if we think about the annual videos. To what extent is there that interest and focus uh, in foreign policy perceptions, debates and engagements uh, in Russia right now? Uh, here in Russia, the most perceptible uh, thing is the great gap between what is being told on TV, what is the content uh, of the state propaganda, what is the uh, content of official speeches, and what is the degree of interest in foreign policy, as we can see it from uh, the polling data, from sociological data. Uh, since 2018, we uh, perceive a steady decline of both interest and I would say pride in foreign policy achievements uh, as interests of people back at home center quite naturally on uh, social and economic issues, economic issues, first of all. Uh, we are in the, I think, seventh year of uh, steady decline of people's real disposable incomes. Uh, 2020 has been a hard year for, uh, for the humanity in general, but uh, here in Russia, it has exasperated those uh, tensions and those difficulties which uh, Russian society lives uh, under. It has been a year of not just uh, lower incomes, but of uh, sharply rising prices of higher consumer inflation. And if we look at the polls at questions like, what, uh, what are your concerns? What are your troubles? Uh, what, what do people fear? We will see that while there's rising uh, tension, there's rising anxiety on every possible subject. Uh, among, among them is the anxiety for the possibility of the um, large-scale war or an armed conflict of Russia with Ukraine or of a foreign invasion or still higher other fears of state repression of police violence. Uh, this is what uh, concerns uh, the respondents politically, but of course the top concerns are the economic ones, uh, low wages, high prices, uh, fear of unemployment. At the same time, on the uh, official public level, every internal political issue is immediately connected uh, to some foreign influence. Everything, protests, um, Alexei Navalny and his uh, activity, uh, the uh, concerns of the uh, younger generation, uh, every, uh, 
elections, of course, parliamentary elections, everything is translated as uh, some uh, foreignly influenced uh, affair. Uh, we have come to the situation when even internal policy issues are decided not by, as we've been used to uh, experience, not by the internal policy block of the presidential administration, but by the security services and by those parts of the security services that specifically uh, deal with um, spying and counter spying. Uh, this is, uh, well, uh, if not an unexpected, at least a, a very uncomfortable situation for almost everybody inside. But coming back to your specific question, what rivets the attention of an observer is, of course, this uh, very, very manifest, a uh, very perceptible uh, gap between what is being told officially and what uh, people care about. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ekaterina, and a good reminder to us that uh, myth making and myths go both ways and, the, and that we are also in a struggle of narratives uh, domestically, regionally and globally. I'm going to move on to our questions now uh, and, and because we already have quite a number, which is great and keep them rolling, folks, as long as we can. Um, can I ask all our authors to, to put on their screens and I will direct some questions to them uh, in due course. So welcome to, to the rest of our authors. Great to have you with us today. Um, the first question I'm going to refer to is from Petra Lunak. And it's really a question about uh, the myth number four in, in the book, which the report, which is Russia is not in a conflict with the West. And so I think particularly how would you respond to the extension of, of the non-enlargement um, pledge? But was this, was this pledge uh, uh, made? Uh, was uh, Gorbachev offered a promise not to enlarge? And did Gorbachev take it for granted that NATO had promised and committed not to enlarge? Um, and so this question is, to what extent and why has this been so pervasive, this myth? And maybe I can bring in one of the authors who's worked a lot on this question, John Luff. I'm going to bring you in to maybe share some thoughts on this myth and its pervasiveness. Th thank you, R Renata. The, the, the question is both complicated and simple because a lot of things were said to Mr. Gorbachev um, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall uh, and the realization that we were going to have a united Germany. There was a lot of discussion about the security arrangements for a united Germany. Mr. Gorbachev thought at one point that Germany could be part of both NATO and the Warsaw Pact. There were some sort of amazing ideas circulating. But he accepted in the end that it was better for the Soviet Union for Germany to be in integrated into, into NATO. There then came the issue of which forces would be located on German territory. So it's in, in, in short, it was quite a, quite a complicated question. Around that time also, some Western leaders, when asked by the Soviet leadership what was going to happen, they said, I think quite sincerely, that they saw no prospect for NATO enlargement beyond the integration of United Germany, because the Soviet Union was still in, its, in existence, you know, as was the, the Warsaw Pact. So I think those remarks were made in uh, quite sincerely. I was at a lunch in 1996, March 1996, with the Russian Foreign Minister Yevgeny Primakov, when he, let, he read out a, a list of statements made by four or five Western leaders uh, to uh, the Soviet side. And he, he basically said, you've, you've broken your word. But the point is, in the meantime, the, the Soviet Union had collapsed. And we were confronted by a, a new geopolitical reality. So to, to say that, that Moscow was deceived is, is, to my mind, to simply assume that the security interests of the Russian Federation should be the same as those of the defunct Soviet Union. Thank you very much for that, um, John. I'm going to keep moving, if I can, just because we have uh, quite a few questions coming in. Maybe the next one uh, from Elizabeth Sears, uh, really building on, on the question that we began with you, Ekaterina, if Putin is not making the decisions, is there a kind of an inner circle, a kind of a cabinet? And that gets at who's in that cabinet and where. Maybe I might start, uh, Nikolai Petrov, I'll ask you to speak first and then Ekaterina, if you'd like to come in with uh, any questions on that. Nikolai. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Renata. There are a lot of speculations in Russia about who exactly and how uh, are making decisions. Uh, well, there are speculations about Putin's Politburo. The problem is that it's absolutely non-transparent and we do have any institutions which uh, can be seen as uh, those uh, who make this decision. So it's absolutely unclear. That's why it's needed to, uh, well, dig uh, uh, down uh, in a very uh, serious way in order to understand how this or that decision has been made. And I would say that in my view, and this is my personal view uh, for sure, uh, any decision can be decomposed and there is some uh, well, major decision or meta decision made earlier, uh, perhaps, well, many years before certain move is made, like say annexation of Crimea, and uh, there is the whole chain of decisions. And if at the initial stage, major shareholders, I would uh, uh, have in mind, first of all, Putin's oligarchs, uh, do participate in making these decisions, then at the very latest stage, perhaps Siloviki or uh, any, any institutions which should realize this or that particular decision are uh, uh, coming to the surface. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. Katerina, and then I'll come to Ben. Do either of you want to add something to this? And feel free also to bring in the question of uh, uh, billionaires and, and the rating of Russian proportionate to its population, so which sees it amongst the top in the world. Katerina. Um, in order not to add uh, to the uh, mysteriousness uh, that we have tried to uh, somehow dispel, I must say that um, every historical comparison has its limits. Uh, I don't think that anything in modern Russia can be compared to Politburo, which was a collective decision-making body. But uh, the nearest approximation towards what is called Putin inner circle is nothing mysterious, but uh, these are the people who are permanent members of the Security Council. They they meet every week. It's quite official. The meeting itself is closed, of course, to the public, but the fact is uh, open. And these meetings have been happening weekly since 2003. Since the moment that the then young President Putin got his own prime minister and his own head of the presidential administration, he has installed these weekly meetings that have been going on for these 17 years. So there's every reason to suppose that these are the people who discuss and decide on the important internal and external uh, policy issues. If you look at the membership uh, of the, the permanent memberships uh, of the Security Council, you will see how stable is this circle of people. They've been there for decades. There has been very little change. Speaking of oligarchs, uh, despite all the comparisons of the Russian political system with the court and of the president with a czar, uh, favoritism is in fact not a prominent feature of Russian political system. Everybody who is anybody either hold official posts or are quite open and well-known beneficiaries of state procurements and state tenders. The state oligarchs are either heads of state corporations and state banks or people like the Rotenbergs or the Kavalchuks who, again, own companies, who win tenders, who receive bu budget grants, who receive state money. There's nothing mysterious about that. There's no, again, as far as we know, there's no Olivier Le Den, uh, there's no Rasputin, uh, there's no mysterious hidden person who has the ear of the president. Again, let us not descend into this fog of uh, mystery. Uh, things are much more open if we choose to um, read this open information correctly. Thanks, Ekaterina. Ben, do you want to add anything before I move on to the next question? Thanks, Renata. I'll just add something very quick, and that's even for those decisions where we know that Putin has played a crucial role, and there certainly are lots of those decisions, I'll, uh, uh, of course, take into account what Nikolai has said about the difficulties in actually working out for every decision what's going on. There are clearly a subset of decisions in which Putin does play an incredibly influential role. However, 
we have to remember that even in those situations, the bureaucracy that uh, Ekaterina and I point to and the inferential role that they play is partly in terms of agenda setting power. They can control to a certain extent the information that is provided to Putin, the options that are put on his table. And so even for those decisions in which Putin plays an incredibly important role, we can't lose sight of this broader environment. And that's precisely what is lost sight of when people focus on the myth that governance in Russia is just down to Putin. And I'll just uh, one one final point for another uh, set of decisions. Uh, we can point to Putin as being an arbiter where he doesn't necessarily impose, dictate his own policy position. He's there to pick between uh, different interest groups vying for power. And the balance of power between those groups can change over time, which is why we see policy U-turns in certain areas quite frequently. That isn't a sign that Putin's vacillating. It's a sign that he's responding to particular interest groups. And as I say, that shifting balance of power over time. Thanks, thanks, Ben. I, I want to sort of frame a couple of questions that have come up about the nature of myths. So I'm going to flag those and then we'll move on to some issues around Russia, US, as, as well as Russia, China policies. So I think the first and it's two questions that are quite closely related, one from Natasha Court uh, and another from Alicia Prochniak. Uh, one is about methodology the deconstruction approach, uh, which suggests there are objective facts behind the myths. And uh, Katerina, you alluded to this. Uh, while many authors have pointed out that the myths are neither real nor false and, and, and somehow part of storytelling uh, around Russia. I'm going to ask you, James, to maybe comment on this, James, sure, if I can, to bring uh, your in this perspective around the deconstructing of these myths. But I want to build on that with Natasha Kurt's question to why, and it's a way the question I started off with, why are there more myths and misperceptions uh, uh, more than ever? And could part of the reason be that there's a, a lack of sufficient investment and expertise on Russia in, in some policy making circles in the West? So James, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that double part question and bring in a couple of other folks. Um, thank you, Renata, and good afternoon to everyone from Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, the, we did not, I think I could fairly say, we did not employ, in the academic sense, a formal methodology, but we recognized that there was a definable problem. All of us, despite our diverse areas of expertise, I think found over 20 to 30 years of working in this area, dealing with different publics, official bodies, um, students and the rest of it, that there is a persistent set of potted orthodoxies, cliches, conceptions that um, we find in many different formats that are either factually wrong in some respects um, significantly, or if not factually wrong, at least um, distorted. Yet what is striking is the pervasiveness and tenacity. And that is why um, we thought it would be a good idea to draw up a short list of these. I assure you there were a great many other issues we wanted to discuss and address them. And, you know, standard contrast, if somebody says, and Arisia address, addressed this directly, um, Crimea has always been Russian, it's just factually wrong. Um, if somebody says, uh, before um, Russia intervened in Ukraine, Russian speakers were in, uh, persecuted there, um, I could say, and a great many others could say with conviction, this is thoroughly wrong, but there are a lot of judgments here and there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. So that is why that we have, that we have a mixture of, um, uh, of issues that can be factually, simply factually addressed and others that are a matter of judgment. I think coming back to um, um, the question, um, I don't know if it was Nett's question, it was, it was, I think, Jana's question uh, about expertise. The two interesting problems. The first is that a large proportion of people who we used to consider Sovietologists, 
were in the past Russianists. They knew the Rus they knew Russia, what we now call Russia, intimately. Um, they did, many of them simply did not and still do not understand Russia's significant neighbors and the former Soviet Union in their own terms, and they did not spend much time in these places. And so here, here are highly expert people who think they know something that they don't necessarily know. So I think that's part of the problem. It's not absence of expertise. What sort of experts are we talking about and how has their expertise been formed? And um, finally, um, there is a, I think there is a communications problem that we face and that governments face, which is much more important than a deficiency of experts. Thanks, James. Uh, interesting thoughts, and I'm sure others will come in uh, on this question. I'm going to move on to a question from Alice Wells now, um, and there's a, there's a follow-up question to it, uh, really about how you as, as a panel see or, or assess the Biden administration's early approach to Russia. And of course, we'll see in two days' time, Lavrov and Lincoln meet in Reykjavik in the margins of the Arctic Council, so maybe Duncan, I can ask, uh, uh, ask you to come in here on, on the Biden administration and how you assess some of their initial uh, interactions. Thank you, Renata. Um, well, look, first of all, let's, let's just be clear that it's still early days. Um, it, this is still a very, we're still in the initial period of the Biden administration. Um, and this is a, a difficult and complex relationship at the best of times, the more so at present. Um, so I would say that my initial impression so far has been pretty favourable. I think this is the, the first administration, the first president who's come to office um, probably since the, the end of the Cold War, who's come, taken office not expecting there to be a significant improvement in relations in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Now, in many ways, that can be considered regrettable, but I think that's a realistic assessment of where the relationship is and it's a realistic assessment also, I suggest, of the reality that there are some major differences of interest between Russia and the US um, that are almost certainly not going to go away anytime soon. And it would be, I think, a grave mistake to build policy on an assumption that those, those significant differences did not exist or were less serious and significant than they really are. So I think that, that that's, that's a really important starting point. Now, having said that, um, I welcome the fact that the US and Russia have, have rolled over the New START um, treaty. Um, it's important more generally that communication and focused dialogue does take place. So therefore, I think it's very important that, that high level meetings do take place as scheduled. Um, not with the expectation necessarily of there being major strides forward in terms of new cooperation and, and new agreements, but at the very least so that areas of disagreement and conflict and confrontation can be clearly delineated and understood on both sides so that both sides can make um, a better attempt at managing those differences. And it seems to me that going forward, managing differences between the US and Russia and between Western countries more generally, on the one hand, and Russia on the other hand, is really should be, the, I think, uppermost in the minds of policymakers. Thanks, Duncan. And I'm going to maybe build on your question to frame one that has come in uh, uh, to um, direct this question to Matthew. Matthew, one of our uh, questions that have come in is about, you know, is it a myth that Ch Vice President Cheney described Russia as a second rate power with nukes? And building on Duncan's approach of a much more yes to discussions, yes to summits, but very clear about what the limits are or where you can engage. What do you see as the prospect in the space of nuclear uh, weapons and nuclear arms control treaties? We have, of course, New START as, as the extension. But is that a scope for structured engagement of the type, the clear-eyed structured engagement that Duncan was talking about between Russia and the US? Absolutely. Thank you, Renata. And it's great to be here. There is definitely scope for engagement, as long as it is based on, I would say, a sort of change of software in the West. 
we are not going to influence Russia's policy. President Putin is not going to feel deterred by our actions or proclamations, and he's not going to change the way he is ruling Russia. What we can do, on the other hand, is in and on ourselves, try to first have a sort of smallest common denominator of what it is we want to achieve, to achieve from and with Russia moving forward. What would be a potential policy cost for us of changing uh, Russia's approach to a certain number of issues and engaging the Kremlin when we have to, while being considerate with the fact that we should not bring any olive branches or making compromises on our values or respond to Moscow's terms. So there are, of course, a certain number of issues we can engage. Arms control, as you very rightly pointed out, is one of them. Not just because we have to discuss these issues jointly, but because they are inherent to uh, wider security implications. The Arctic, and you, you mentioned also the Reykjavik meeting, is an issue and is a, a growing uh, space for geopolitical competition where we have an interest in dealing with these things jointly in an era of low tension, as we call it. So as long as we are aware that we should not fall into the, you know, the sort of pitfalls of coming to Russia, rushing to Russia, just because we need to deal with the Kremlin for every single and smallest policy issue in the world, there is, very, there is something that we should be cognizant of. And on, on your last point, on the, this mention of Russia as a second tier power, this is of course getting under um, the leadership skin in the Kremlin, as you can imagine. This is denying Russia's sense of great power status and sense of entitlement that it is more sovereign or more than any other country. And this is a trend of thought that we have in the US right now, for instance, with this logic that Russia is a declining power, and therefore we should basically not bother with, with a, you know, a declining Russia, because it will once again um, lose, it, you know, lose its status and not be an, an impediment, while China is the greater threat. I would argue this is another myth, and that could have been an 18th chapter in a way to our report, uh, but that might be for a follow-up, I would argue. Thank you. Thanks, Mathieu, and thanks for bringing some concrete policy recommendations also to, into your discussions. I'm going to turn back to Annette and maybe James in this question now, because we've had a number of questions come in about the Sino-Russian relationship. Uh, one question that echoes uh, some aspects that you've referred to already, Annette, ongoing in the, in particular, U.S. policy debate about from the question that the U.S. should seek to wean Russia off its cozy alignment with China. Uh, and they, they quote some of the debates that are going on, including Charles Kupchin, for example, but others, I think, that we hear in the U.S. debate. Uh, to what extent do you think this is overblown? You flagged it already that you think there are some limits in it, but uh, how can one uh, effectively engage with this uh, debate ongoing that somehow the West can and should wean Russia off and, uh, this alignment? Well, thank you, Renata. Yes, I certainly agree with you that this particular myth is primarily a US-led policy debate and a perennial favorite of US presidential administrations in particular, although it has gained some traction in France and Australia uh, to a much more limited degree. But indeed, numerous policymakers and commentators have warned that the West ignores the Russia-China's revisionist axis of authoritarian at its own peril, urges Washington to act before it's too late, um, but this, of course, fundamentally misunderstands Western leverage for a start. It gives rise to the false notion that Washington and its allies have the leverage and the capacity to split the Russia-China Entente apart, despite numerous failed attempts in the past and the Kremlin's unequivocally advers adversarial stance towards the West. Quite simply, what the West is not joined together it cannot put asunder. But mainly, this myth misunderstands the nature of the Sino-Russian relationship itself, including the factors that draw the two powers closer together, as well as those that constrain it. And I referred to those earlier in this, in this webinar. Um, so it, 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 not least, there are terrible policy implications. But I think that I've, I've said my two words on, on this, and I probably James, who's also written a chapter on on uh, a, a different myth, a slightly different slant, perhaps, would have more to say. Yeah, and if I may, before I bring it in, James, to you, I also want to reflect a question from Dara McDowell that how do we understand the potential implications of the Sino-Russia relationship for Russia's policy towards India? And of course, uh, 
traditionally the relatively close relationship that Moscow and New Delhi had for many years. Is there an implication of, of some tension there or can that be bridged? I'll start with you, James, and then if anyone else wants to come in. Uh, sure. Just to continue uh, Annette's thoughts and, and, and the previous, your, your question, or, or um, I can't remember whose question it was now, but before I move on to Dara's, um, then the myth that I wrote about, actually, I suppose it's not really a myth. We use myth in the, in the loosest sense. It's more highly inadvisable policy action, I think. Some, as James Scher said, some are factually incorrect. This is highly, the idea that Russia should be uh, brought on side in order to deal with the greater, supposedly longer term systemic threat of China uh, is, as I said at the beginning, you know, quite faddish at the moment, but it apart, quite apart from the, the moral vacuousness that would be involved and the sacrifices that would be involved of uh, a detente with Russia, well, that would involve effectively some form of new Yalta, um, then it just wouldn't work. <laughs> it wouldn't work partly because the Russians don't particularly wish to be associated with uh, a declining power. Sorry, the Chinese don't wish to be associated with a declining power like Russia. And actually, the Russians are actually also quite cautious about getting too close to China because they know, they know about its um, abilities as well. So it also, the problem with it is that it presupposes that some form of relationship, some form of workable relationship cannot be worked out with China. Um, it may or it may not. I honestly don't know. But I think, I think we should... Um, we, we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't we should be mindful of the possibilities at least there, which I don't think is true as far as Russia is concerned. I know my colleague Kolya Petrov and I have <laughs> disagreed over this over time. I think that uh, any sort of relationship with the current regime in Russia, um, you know, beyond the most low hanging fruit, is as near as impossible as you could possibly imagine, um, based upon the truly irreconcilable. Uh, differences in, frankly, in worldview. Um, as far as Dara McDowell's question is concerned and Russia and India, I mean, there has long been talk of uh, a Russia-India-China triangle. Um, again, it has no real, it has no more traction, no more basis in reality than, than the, the axis of, uh, than, 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 I don't know, the, not the axis of convenience, I know Bobo Lowe is listening in as well, but it has, it has no more basis in reality than a, than a, a strategic partnership between, between Russia and China. When it is appropriate and opportune, then the Russians and the Indians do indeed get on, but they have a, they have a tremendous amount in common, but nobody wants to be hitched um, or locked in to uh, a relationship with powers that can undermine as much as they can assist. Thanks, James. And I can already see lots of questions uh, about the nature of statecraft if it isn't about compromise across uh, different worldviews. But we can come back to that in, in a moment. I, I'm going to suggest, colleagues, that uh, we, we focus, turn a little bit to some of the economic questions that are coming up right now. And then I'd like to come to some of the questions around Central Asia and Russia's near abroad before we get to some of the questions about Russia's perceptions, thinking, and the extent to which Russia wants to be understood. So let me first turn to you, Nigel, if I may, Nigel Gould Davis. Nigel, you've written the, the paper that was there in the report on sanctions. And uh, I think we heard from Keir talking about part of Russia's adventurism, perhaps, or, or increased activity globally is, is, a, is an economic one. There is both an economic reasons, but there's also some more economic capabilities. But we also heard from Ekaterina just the concern and and uh, economic constraint uh, that is felt. So the question from Paul Waller is really about the current state of Russian resources and whether Russia has the capacity, the financial resources to maintain uh, a significant military uh, engagement uh, and profile uh, at home and abroad and, and whether sanctions are having any impact on this. So maybe over to you, Nigel. Okay, thank you. So yes, two, two parts to, to that question. On the Russian eco economy, uh, and its financial condition more broadly. There's, there's much that one could say, but very briefly, uh, someone, I think it was Ekaterina, referred earlier to the fact that uh, the Russian economy now is, has been stagnant for some time. In fact, uh, Bank of Finland's just come out with some work that, that suggests that real disposable incomes are now as low as they were 10 years ago. So yes, it's been a bad COVID year, but that has followed several previous pre-COVID years of chronic uh, systemic underperformance. And there is no reason to think 
Unfortunately, that situation will change as long as the system remains essentially as it is. Uh, so e economically problematic. That does not necessarily mean that Russia cannot sustain significant uh, military forces, uh, both conventional, and Putin also talks a great deal about, uh, uh, about investment in, in hypersonic weapons, perhaps a little more than is warranted, uh, but also note uh, that uh, in his, uh, one of the most memorable uh, remarks from his, uh, his recent State of the Nation address uh, was his threat that any, uh, any challenge to Russia's red lines, as Russia defined them, would be asymmetric. Uh, and we've seen, of course, Russia invest in relatively inexpensive, but uh, in, in their own terms, uh, sometimes effective cyber uh, weapons as well. And that's something, of course, Kier and others can, can speak about. Financially, Russia has worked hard to build up war chests uh, and uh, protect itself from adverse uh, international circumstances, whether caused by crises like in 2007-2008 or by uh, Western uh, policies that might try to uh, uh, impose uh, pain and pressure uh, on, uh, on Russia. Uh, so that's very, very briefly on the, on, on the broad situation there. Um, specifically on sanctions, uh, I see this, this myth or, or misconception, and I, I accept that reasonable people can hold a version of it, although I do think it is a, a misconception, is a misconception not only about Russia, but about sanctions themselves. And I think more broadly, we don't really have as clear a way as thinking about sanctions and what they can do uh, as an instrument of statecraft, uh, especially against large powers, um, as, as we should. Uh, we will all be thinking more about economic statecraft in, in coming decades uh, for not only Russian reasons, but China reasons uh, as well. Uh, Russia is the largest country to have been uh, subjected to major economic sanctions uh, since uh, the Second World War, essentially. Uh, and it's an area where the West enjoys enormous, again, that word, uh, asymmetric superiority, uh, not only economic, um, but more significantly financial. And above all, it's the United States that has the, uh, the nuclear weapon, so to speak, of the fact that the dollar has this uniquely important role as a, as, a, as a global reserve currency. It has put on notice, not only the Russian state, but Russian uh, elites, that it has the capacity to target them and largely cut them off from the global financial system, uh, if it wishes to. Uh, a, a, a threat that's, uh, uh, that uh, has been implemented in limited ways, but the West knows and Russia knows, could be done on a much uh, larger scale. And I'll just finish by applying this to, to, to the most recent uh, uh, moment of tension we've seen, the, the Russian military buildup uh, on uh, uh, Ukraine's eastern border, and then it's, it's draw down again. In the wake of that, a senior White House official expressed satisfaction at the, uh, the impact that the Biden administration's new sanctions policy and sanctions strategy had had on Russian behavior. Uh, a very significant moment. And, and to just to touch finally on your question about the Biden administration's approach to uh, Russia policy, uh, I do, as Duncan said, see it as a, a, a much more uh, effective and coordinated approach than we've seen uh, under the previous administration. And the most significant aspect of it so far has been a much more disciplined and forward looking and systematic approach to, to sanctions, this formidable instrument. Great, thank you, Nigel. I'm going to continue this question about economic policies and maybe if I can move to you, Katerina. Um, and it's really around some of the questions that liberal market reform was bad for Russia, that many Western business interests benefited from the chaos of, of the liberalization in the 1990s. If we could turn the clock back, are there a set of, of Western policies toward Russia that could have help to bring about a different outcome? And this is a question from Samantha Debenda. Katerina. Uh, I can't quite say that I'm the right person to no, sorry. answer hey, this. Katerina, so, yes. sorry, my, my question. I'm speaking to Katerina Wolsiuk from University no. of Berlin. My apologies, sorry, I should have picked out my right Katerina. Thank you very much. Um, there's no doubt that the 1990s, following the collapse of the USSR, was a very traumatic and difficult period um, in Russian history. 
Having said that, we were collectively, not only we in the West, but also in Russia, learning about the Soviet Union, that it was a very comprehensive, but also shallow state. And when it collapsed overnight, um, it basically it was filled with all kinds of practices, the long-term consequences of which we still live with today. So from that point of view, I can really refer everybody to the myth, which deals very well with blaming the West for what happened in Russia. And uh, this is about the collapse of the Soviet Union, the nature of the Soviet Union, and the decision makers. We may have been wiser, but nobody was. And to blame the West for how Russia has developed over the last 30 years, I think it's, a, it's one of those sort of, one of the sort of perhaps fattest myths that we have still prevailing. But what we have also, when it comes to the long sort of term consequences, not only that the Soviet Union, how it was created, but how it basically crumbled within weeks. So we didn't even have our Brexit process, which took five years. It happened within weeks and months, and we had the most tightly integrated controlled country in the world, and it basically disintegrated. So from that point of view, we wish we had a bit more foresight what it meant, but well-meaning advice from the West, there was no imposition, there was no really, it was take up, it was interest from the Yeltsin team. But what we have is the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the USSR. And it's very important because the parallels that have been mentioned here in terms of Politburo, for example, the inner circle, who makes decisions, this, uh, idea of Russia being governed by a tight group, which is basically not embodied in any particular formal institutions, also means that our Western approach, and this really feeds so many myths that we have, we tend to approach Russia and the post-Soviet countries in a compartmentalized -like way, either sanctions, economics, or ethnic relations, or conflict, or politics. This sense, sense of segregation of different sort of problem solving issues does not really help us to understand, especially when we have this joined up thinking in Russia. And I would like to stress the issue of complexity. You know, who of us knows so much about trade relations, ethnic issues in Ukraine versus the history of Crimea? So we are all collectively caught in this constant sort of need to keep expand our expertise, and it's hardly surprising that busy policymakers and public officials look for quick problem-solving approaches based on myths rather than a deep, long sort of exposure to how Russia functions and what it's trying to achieve in the world. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Katrina. And that brings us very much to a question I'd like us to get to before the end and bring in Orisa and Ais on uh, Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, and because one of the questions uh, that has come in is the scale to which we think there could be conflict over the notion of spheres of influence. And of course, that's one of the myths that you tackle in this report, but the idea that there are some spheres of influence that must be recognized and respected and obviously pertain particularly to Ukraine. So, so Orisa, I'm going to start with you. To what extent do we see real prospects for uh, conflict and continued misunderstanding and misperception in, in understanding the, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Thank you very much, Renata. And I'm, I'm really pleased, of course, that the, the target of this report is Western policymakers, but indirect beneficiary of better policy will be the whole of Russia's neighborhood and especially countries such as Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, that have an aspiration for Euro-Atlantic integration. And it, it is better understanding of what, um, what the future for these, re, for these specific countries holds that will help Western policymakers to formulate a better policy. And I think here, of course, Russia wants to blur the lines. It wants to create chaos. It wants to off, uh, offset Western policymakers. And I do hope that these publications will you know, help us put our thoughts in order better because we do know that our thoughts determine our action. 
And, and I think it's important today that our launch take place on the 76th anniversary of deportation of Crimean Tatars. And it's quite symbolic that they, when they were deported in 1944, over 180,000 people were sent to Kazakhstan and half of them died on, on, on route. In 2014, 70 years later on, almost 35,000 people had to flee. And this is what we call, you know, Russia is predictable, Russia is repetitive, and there are patterns. Of course, history, you know, teaches us some lessons. And, and, I, and I think we already see conflict in the region. It's not hypothetical um, situation. There is conflict in Donbass, where over 13, 14, actually, thousand people dead because of that conflict. And the West is already involved as you know, being a, a pro-Ukrainian supporter in this way. And this the report in particular gives very strong policy recommendations. It says, insists that Russia is not entitled to exclusive spheres of influence, reject the concept of a single Russian nation encompassing Ukraine and Belarus. These are very important messages that we do hope that Western policymakers take to heart and mind and will actually stay strong and committed, not just by proclaiming concerns, but by building resilience of countries such as Ukraine, Moldova, uh, and protecting uh, nascent democracy and opposition in Belarus. Thank you, Arisia. Uh, Anais, uh, can, can maybe you help us think about maybe the, the final question I'd like to put out today from Anthony Foreman in, in the chat, which is, can we imagine a way in which examining these myths and looking to better understand uh, perceptions and thinking uh, within and uh, across Russia and uh, in the West could lead to a better integration of perhaps interests and capacity to engage? Do you see these myths as a way of informing better policymaking as Arisa suggested? Uh, thank you, Renata. Yeah, I, I fully subscribe to what uh, Orisha just said. I think it's important to remember as well that, uh, well, the myth that, for example, I tackle upon in, in, in my chapter on, on the um, unity, uh, alleged uh, national unity between uh, Russia, Belarus and, and Ukraine, uh, they are um, important to, uh, because they, they breed other myths uh, about uh, Crimea having always been Russian, about um, uh, Belarus, for example, not having uh, the, uh, the the right to uh, be a standalone uh, nation, uh, allowed, for example, to opt for neutrality instead of alignment with Russia, uh, etc. And what we have noticed while doing this research is that in some countries, uh, even in the West, um, even in my home countries, for, for example, in France, um, there are numerous um, intellectuals or uh, politicians, members of parliament, members of the European parliament, who tend to uh, actually deny uh, any kind of um, um, actorness and, and legitimacy to, to exist outside of this Russian sphere of influence to, uh, to Ukraine and, and Belarus. And I believe that at this time, uh, with the events that are taking place in both countries, it is important to, to remind that, well, they do have the right to, to, to choose their geopolitical orientations. And very much part of a question about shaping perhaps the future of EU uh, Russian and US Russian relations. And of course, as we know, um, the Secretary of State, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited Ukraine already last week. So, so to that extent, Anis and Orisa, it might be quite central as we think about the, some of those Western Russian relationships. I would love colleagues if we could continue the questions. We have questions on Nord Stream 2. We have questions about Russian perceptions about myths, about whether the extent to which Russia is a political and education system contribute to those myths or not. But I think what this illustrates is the richness of this report. You might not agree with all the myths in it or indeed the treatment of myths. And as Ekaterina said, it's important not to further mystify myths. So I think uh, this report is intended to both unpack certain myths uh, and with a view to perhaps also suggest some possible avenues for engagement with and on Russia. Uh, and I think it's certainly going to be uh, one that has lots of controversy, one that has lots of issue interests, and we would really welcome your continued engagement with us on this. 
So let me just congratulate all the authors for, for really engaging with us today, for your work to date in, in this report. Um, please do follow uh, the report online. I know that we will continue to have events on this and perhaps allow us to go into more depth into any one of those particular sets of issues because each one is so large. But let me just thank our all of the panelists today, uh, congratulate them on the report. Uh, it's, it's, I think, interesting from a political science perspective, as well as we think about myths and how we understand that in our narratives, what that means for expertise and how we go forward in formulating practical policy proposals. Let me also just uh, thank you, all the, uh, the audience, for joining us today and uh, very much hope that you continue to engage with this on our dialogue uh, on ways forward in Russia and Eurasia. So with that, thank you very much. And we look forward to your future engagement. Bye-bye. Thank you.